go. Good afternoon, everybody. There we go. So I'll be talking now a bit about implementing parallel testing in uh, the parallel test suite. This is work that I, I did Ooh. mostly last year. I'm glad someone realizes this, this exists. So uh, my goal here is to uh, sort of share some of the, the joy and excitement that, that Jim and I feel about uh, getting this project. Um, mostly working, um, not quite fully enabled, but uh, but there. And, and uh, uh, talking about some of the challenges and the, and the trials I had in, in getting to this point, and some of the trials to come. So um, this graph you've already seen. This data comes from uh, from Daniel. <coughs> Uh, you can see the, the tests being added over time. So um, this is great that we're, we're adding tests. We want to, to uh, make sure that we don't have regressions and um, curl behavior over um, as we make more changes in the future. But the problem is when you have, how many tests is that? Close to 1,900 tests. It can take some time to actually run them. Um, and if you're running uh, Valgrind as well, then that time increases even more. So um, <coughs> simply on my development machine, it can take about 10 minutes to, to run through the, the tests. And that doesn't include uh, Stefan's uh, Pi test as well, those just the, the regular ones. Those are the only ones I'll be talking about today anyway. So it, it really slows down the developer's velocity. Um, the, the edit, compile, and test cycle is, is bottlenecked at that, that test stage. Um, I love being able to just make a change, boom, hit a button, compile, test it, see if it works or not. But when it takes 10 minutes to get to that point, it really slows you down. So, um, curl tests are being added roughly linearly, but the problem is single core CPU performance doesn't really go uh, that much faster than linearly. You can see some of the, the, the points here, these green points, they come from um, uh, Carl Rook, who does a periodic blog post every couple years looking at the state of the art and things. Um, the last few points, um, I think you see my cursor here, where did it go? On this side? Well, where, oh, there we go. <laughs> there it is. Okay. Um, so these last few points I uh, extrapolated from his data. He didn't put them in there. Uh, he didn't exactly explain the criteria used to choose these, but it comes from the same data source. But you can see it, it's going up, but um, not, you know, what you, what you would typically think uh, about Moore's Law. So Moore's Law is supposed to double every uh, 18 months, but Moore's Law isn't actually talking about the speed, he's actually talking about the, um, the density, number of transistors on a chip. So the smaller process size that gets you more transistors on a chip generally gets you a uh, higher speed as well, but the increased number of transistors doesn't directly equal increased speed. And you see now the, the maximum speed of CPUs as well has sort of plateaued around the 6 gigahertz mark for many years now. Um, but the extra transistors that you get on a, a die now can go into making multiple cores. <coughs> and that's where most of the performance is coming uh, these days. So here's another view. Uh, this <coughs> is the um, number of cores per CPU. So you can see up to you know roughly 2010, uh, it was unusual to have uh, a lot of cores on, on a chip, but since then, uh, they just skyrocketed. Um, I'll show you some test results later of a CPU with 192 threads. Um, so they're not exactly cores, but uh, that's, that's a lot of, of threads you can run at once. Um, so the curls test suite was, was not built with parallelism in mind. Um, it started back in the year 2000 when if you had one core, you were, you were lucky. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it started with four test cases right at the very beginning, and it made assumptions that there's only one uh, server of each type. So when, <coughs> when I say server here, I'm talking about the test server that uh, serves HTTP or FTP or SMTP or something, something that responds to a core request and, and um, gives, gives you the result of your query. Uh, but of course, that's, that's all you need for one test running at once. So the framework was, is fully custom Perl code. It's not based on any particular uh, existing framework. Uh, each test is configured in uh, one file, um, so all you need, all the inputs, all the out expected outputs, the servers that you need, all that is, is um, in a single place, uh, except for some tests require custom code and, and that's separate. 
so the test suite starts all test servers are needed for each case, whether that's a, an entity server or something else. And uh, each test uses one or sometimes more servers. <coughs> so there are shared files used throughout. There's um, files used for controlling the server, um, for writing logs. Uh, there's PID files for uh, accessing the server later. Um, so this is kind of the view of Curl's test suite as of uh, last year, uh, before this, this work went through. There we go. Uh, so you can see right in the middle, this is run tests, uh, which is the entry point for the test suite. You can see that there is um, at most one curl uh, process that is running to do the, the tests. Uh, before the test start, it starts um, n any number of, of test servers, and it writes to a single log directory, and it reads all the test data from one test at a time, but there's, there's a, a lot of tests. Uh, this dashed line is a process boundary, so everything uh, to the above and to the right of the line runs in a separate process. So, um, so even if we had written the test framework, or the test, the curl test framework, using an existing uh, framework of some sort of test framework to make it uh, potentially easier to run in parallel, um, it most likely would have been just a single pool of servers anyways because that's all the, uh, the test needed and that's uh, would have been a wasted effort at that point. Um, the, the reason being that starting up a new test server is, is slow, uh, there's startup time, there's verification time that the server is running properly, and the memory use is, is not trivial as well. If, if you have uh, multiple test servers, your, your memory usage goes up. And again, back in 2000, we didn't have a whole lot of memory. Typically, you'd have 32 megabytes of RAM and 233 megahertz of um, your clock speed with a single core. Um, so, can you show a picture of, of an old curl uh, server once uh, before it was upgraded? Like the one serving hacks or something? Yes. Or something? Yeah. yeah, so I don't know if I'm quite that far back, but uh, uh, it, it, those of you who are old enough in this room can remember servers like, like this. But these days, of course, we got much, much better <coughs> servers than that. So how can we take advantage of that so we can get the, the test times down, get that the compile test uh, cycle working properly, or working faster, rather? So there's a number of options I looked at. The first option is uh, running one test server per test process. So essentially, um, you would have multiple copies of, of run tests, uh, .pl. So you'd have um, one of them just running the FTP tests, one of them just running the SMTP test, another HTTP, et cetera, et cetera, and uh, all running simultaneously. So essentially, one per protocol. Uh, so that way you can run all these different protocol uh, tests in, in parallel, speeding things up. Um, so this would be fairly easy to implement. Um, so some of those shared control files and stuff I mentioned would have to be separated so that you can uh, control different services at once. Um, so I actually prototyped something like this back in 2017, and I was able to run uh, many tests in parallel, um, all, all in the same directory. So um, it, it was doable, and that proof of concept showed me that it was, um, it would have been, it would have made a difference. But the problem is the, this particular approach was really limited in the amount of parallelism that you could uh, achieve. Um, because you, I was running one set of tests per protocol, um, the, uh, you were really limited by the number of tests that were uh, had different um, protocols, different unique protocols that you could run in parallel. And of course, in test suite, um, 95 of the tests only used one server. But the problem is 60% of all tests use HTTP. So uh, at most, you could run 40% of tests in, in parallel, so you wouldn't have even gotten a, a double doubling in speed. So it would have been a lot of effort, well not a lot, it would have been some effort and for minimal um, speed up, so I didn't think it was worthwhile doing. But what it did do was uh, spark a, a germ of an idea in, in my mind of how I could take this prototype a little bit further and actually um, make it something worthwhile to implement. So I knew that would have been weeks or, or months of work and um, didn't make sense at the time. So another option would have been to rewrite the, the curl <coughs> test using a test framework, like um, an existing one th uh, that works in curl. 
Um, I'm sure there's dozens of them in CPAN. I didn't seriously <coughs> consider this. Um, I would have had to first fix the uh, some of these issues with the servers, like the, the control files and the like, um, anyways, to, to run them concurrently. Uh, and then we've had to rewrite the entire test suite assembly to use this, this new framework. Um, the framework would also would have only handled the test scheduling. And if you look at the number of lines of code, there's 13,000 commented lines of code in, in the, just in the test harness. This is mostly Perl stuff uh, back in, in Perl 8.0.1 when it started looking at this. And that doesn't include the tests themselves or uh, the, the test servers either. It's just the, the main harness. Uh, so there's a lot of code that would have had to be rewritten to, uh, to do this option. Um, so another option I, I thought of was sharding the test suite. So this is essentially running several copies of the test suite at the same time. So you would uh, run a bunch of run tests. Um, each one would run maybe 100 tests or something. And uh, they'd all run simultaneously uh, in, in independent directories. So it would be completely independent. This was actually possible to do. Uh, manually, since version 7.72.0 some years ago. Uh, this was the, the version that introduced automatic um, port selection for, for test servers. So you could uh, run more than one um, make test on a single machine without anything colliding, uh, as long as it was in a different directory. Um, so option three, right. So in this case, the, uh, the approach I was looking at would have been having a master controller that would have parsed the output of um, each um, each server as it as it runs um, its its set of tests. Uh, you'd have the master controller automatically sharding the tests over a number of different processes. Um, the problem is combining the test outputs would have been super messy. Uh, when you if you've seen the tests run, you'll, you'll see okay it says um, test 001 then the name of the test. Then there's a, a short pause while the test runs, and it says, okay, and then off to the next one. Problem is if there's something goes wrong, then it says, oh, failure, and there's a failure code, and then here's the contents of the test directory, and it shows you a whole bunch of uh, test outputs, um, and then goes on to the next test. So um, trying to, to get a, a controller just to parse this output and make sense of it and keep them separate would have been a tricky task, wouldn't have been completely uh, error-free, and errors also would have been easy um, to miss. Uh, uh, if this wasn't uh, done. So running 40 tests at once would have been just a schmozzle of, of output of, from different tests running all at the same time um, it, if you didn't attempt to sort of combine them somehow. And at the end, of course, you'd have 40 different summaries looking like this. So, uh, so you can imagine 40 of these sitting on the screen. Um, any errors would be just completely invisible to the user. So uh, this sort of approach might have worked for a CI case where the CI just runs in the background, and then it tells you, oh, everything worked, green uh, PR, or no, there was some sort of error. And of course, in that error case, you'd have to go and you'd have to, to dig through this ugly output, trying to make sense of it and uh, uh, figure out what actually is, is wrong. Um, so it wouldn't have been really usable for, for developers. So finally, I came up with this internal sharding solution, and this is the one that I eventually implemented. So this was to uh, involve re-architecting the existing Perl test suite to allow this, this sort of internal sharding of, of tests between processes. Uh, you'd have a single master controller process that would um, coordinate everything, uh, and then multiple um, runner processes that would actually take care of, of running Perl, uh, starting all the servers necessary, and uh, collecting the, the test success fail um, data. Um, so instead of parsing the, the text output, the raw test uh, output of the existing test uh, suite, it would use an RPC mechanism to talk uh, from the controller to the runners. And this RPC mechanism would pr preserve the semantics of the, the, the test um, output, the uh, failure status, um, as well as statistics for, for time <coughs> and like, and then send that back to the, the master controller, which would then process that and give you a nice uh, human uh, readable output. So uh, this, um, I felt, would provide the, the best sort of uh, uh, outcome for developers. It would have, it'd be most cons uh, compatible with existing workflows, uh, less for developers to have to, to think about when they're, they're running their tests, most familiar. Uh, and the work level, I thought, was comparable to some of the other solutions, 
um, at least the ones that had similar amount of compatibility and, and ease of use. So I didn't think it would be too crazy to do. Um, right, the controller, uh, yeah, gives you output the same as before. So this is kind of what the, the uh, process model looks like uh, in the, the current running curl. Uh, well, I'll just describe. You can see the runner process in the middle. Uh, again, at the top, it's running single copy of uh, the curl binary. It's running all the test servers that it, uh, it used to itself. Uh, but in this case, the log directory is different. There's a single log directory per runner. Uh, and this solves the problem with, with control files and uh, logs stepping on each other. Each runner has its own copy, so none of them uh, step on each other. And on the left, you have the, uh, the single coordinator process that starts up all the runners and uh, handles the coordination of uh, passing tests to it and taking all the results back and, uh, and writing all the output. <coughs> so this was um, uh, a few months of uh, work to do. It took, uh, I counted about 61 commits to get it into a, a usable state. There's uh, an issue, 10818, if you want to follow along. <coughs> uh, I didn't want to do a, a big bang integration of all this there's a, a lot that would have to change to, to make this work. I wanted to, to do it in stages so that I could make sure that I'm not breaking everything, um, anything before I get to the, the final stage. Um, th and also things change so quickly in, in curl, I didn't want it, uh, a couple months of work to, to have to really slow down by another week of, uh, of merging and um, getting things together. So um, some of the implementation, implementation steps that I had to go through to get this point. Uh, the first big one was to, uh, a bunch of refactoring. Um, so I cleaned up the main test loop. I created a number of distinct test stages. Um, so this is all stuff that was happening before, but it wasn't all happening at uh, in, in one place. It was sort of spread out. Uh, things were added in, um, in places as they were needed and uh, without really considering the parallel testing case because that didn't make any sense back then. So I, I cleaned that up and uh, made a number of distinct stages. And if you look at, at some of the stages here, um, you'll see that these ones right in the middle just happen to be the ones that would have to be run in a separate process in the, the parallel testing stage. So the controller handles the verification that things should be run, and then it uh, then sends a message to the runner to start the server as necessary, checks the test environment, prepares it, runs the test command, and then cleans up after it's done. And then the, the, the runner sends its results back to the controller, which verifies that the succeeded and then does a post-test check. So, um, yeah, so you can see the, the nice breaks in the process uh, boundary in, in this scenario here. So uh, one of the things that um, this refactoring did change, uh, pretty subtle I thought, but um, it was picked up right away by, uh, by one particular notable benevolent uh, developer, uh, which was that uh, it needed the test runner or the test controller rather needed to read in all the tests at the beginning in order to get them ready to, to send to the, uh, the runners as uh, it progressed. And during that that reading uh, at the beginning, it would actually know that it had to skip some tests and it would write a message immediately. So as soon as you start the test, you see you know a dozen lines coming up. Oh, I'm only skipping this test. Oh, this one, this one, this one. So it used to be interspersed with the other tests as they went along, but now they're at the beginning. So if that bothers you, I'm sorry. <laughs> Live with it. Um, so, re-implementation, or refactoring rather, was, was one thing, and uh, that was relatively straightforward. But actually moving to a multi-process scenario was a lot trickier. And Windows, I'm looking at you. <laughs> uh, portability, of course, is, is super important for curl itself and for the test suite itself. Um, basically, you don't need anything beyond the, the regular curl installation of standard curl modules in order to run the test suite, and uh, I wanted to keep that. Um, so Perl does provide emulated feature, uh, versions of some features that Windows um, doesn't provide, but uh, if you, 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 you can't rely on some of the, the dark corners of the POSIX spec. You have to just rely on what Perl guarantees when it gives you these emulated versions of, of some of these things. Um, yeah, so I didn't want to have to make a, uh, another mandatory Perl package um, because that, that would just exclude a lot of different places where they could otherwise use a test server. Uh, so that meant I, I had to implement my own RPC mechanism, for example. Um, so the, because the RPC requirements were pretty simple, I decided just to use some low-level Perl primitives that were built in. 
for cryptocurrency, I just used Fork. Um, and for communication uh, IPC between the runner and controller, I just used Pipe. And for serialization of data between the, the processes, just the, the regular Perl pack, unpack, and freeze thaw functions. So this is all built into regular Perl. You didn't need anything else. Uh, so the RPC um, mechanism I decided on looks something like this. So uh, a call from the controller to a runner would use the, the top line here. They basically send a four byte integer over the, the pipe. Um, the runner then would, would read that four byte integer. It knows it's gonna be four bytes. And then it can, uh, it knows how many more bytes are gonna be available for the function in the arguments. So it just reads that number and then it uh, can decode the, the data. So the length is just a four byte integer. Everything else after that is a, um, a Perl array that has been uh, serialized. Uh, the first element of the array is the function name that you're calling, and the rest are just the arguments of that function. So the runner has a lookup table for every function name that it, it has. It's just a string that in the, uh, uh, in the RPC message. Um, yeah, and uh, once it sends or calls that function, it just passes in the arguments. That function knows how many arguments to expect, and it better get that, uh, that number or uh, there'll be trouble. Uh, but again, the controller knows what it needs, so that's, that won't be an issue in real life. So once that function call is being performed on the runner, then it sends the results back, and that is done in a similar way on the return pipe. It writes a four byte length, and then all the values are just in a, a serialized Perl array. Uh, once again, the controller knows what function to call it, it knows what return values it's gonna expect, and so it knows how to interpret those. So one thing about this mechanism, nice and simple, nice and easy, but it does <coughs> limit you to um, purely synchronous calls. There's no async uh, allowed over here. Uh, the, the runner can't just send some arbitrary message back saying, oh, um, there was an error or, or some other response other than what that function call expects. Um, so that's not really a, uh, an issue because all the function calls have some sort of error code that they return back. So just the function itself returns an error in the standard format that's expected. So the controller has uh, a main loop that uh, starts with a select on, on all the pipes. Um, there's one pipe, well, two pipes, a write, write and a read on uh, each runner. So it just selects on all those read pipes. Uh, as soon as it gets data available, then it just reads that integer. Then it reads another <coughs> uh, four gigabytes of, of data uh, to the whole read. <coughs> um, now you have to be careful not to avoid this uh, the pipe state getting out of sync because uh, you don't want a situation where the, the uh, controller has some sort of abnormal situation and it might read the the integer and then um, be interrupted or something and, and not read the, the rest of the data. Then <coughs> the next time it comes through and it expects the integer again, it's, it's going to get out of sync. It's going to read the wrong thing. Uh, so there's a, a couple of areas in the code where you just have to be careful, especially in the shutdown scenario, because it's possible that you can interrupt after the read of the, the number of bytes and before the, the rest of the data is, is read. Uh, so it's just a matter of being careful there. Um, but the, the other tricky thing is that each, uh, each pipe is, is at the other end. There's a runner on the end of each pipe, and that runner is running potentially some completely different RPC uh, than every other one. So that means each pipe essentially has a, a state machine to track where it is in each one. Uh, the state machine is, is pretty straightforward, but it, it has to be there. So uh, it starts, <coughs> I can't quite read it in my little view over here. It starts in the uh, init stage where it's just created and everything is blank. Then it goes into the, uh, right, the clear lock stage. This is um, in case the some existing servers in that runner uh, are not, um, they don't claim that they're finished yet. Uh, we have to <coughs> the servers clear the locks before we can uh, continue. Uh, and once that's done, if necessary, then it goes into the initialized stage. And then uh, the, the pre process stage where the, the servers are started uh, up. And when the servers are started and ready, at that point you can run the tests. And in between all these state transitions, there's an RPC going on. So, uh, and each state again uh, is, is a, 
the state machine goes into that state by calling an RPC. So uh, once it gets to that state, it knows what response to expect from the runner, and so it can interpret it properly. Uh, so other than the, just the basic straightforward view, all the other state transitions are just error cases, except for the, uh, the valid run case, which happens to have a slightly different uh, return value here, but it's considered a, um, I, I diagrammed it as a, a different transition. Yeah. So the controller's main loop um, has to be non-blocking. And that is because right at the, the beginning when uh, this server is starting up, uh, the controller is starting up and it's uh, getting all the tests ready to run. Uh, once it sends uh, a test to the first runner, um, it, the, it, it's doing all this within the loop. So uh, it can't block waiting for that response because it's got all these idle runners that it has to pass another test to. So it uh, then continues <coughs> in the loop and uh, spots that, hey, there's an idle runner, let's give it another test, and it keeps going like that. Um, so once all the runners are, are running, then theoretically <coughs> it could block and just wait for a response from any uh, of those runners. But there is one uh, extraordinary case, which means that we, we have to stay non-blocking, and that is the uh, global abort flag. If you hit Control C, then there's a global flag that's set in the uh, the signal handler, and this main loop checks that periodically and then does a clean shutdown of everything when that happens. So um, once the all the idle, all the runners uh, are idle in the main loop, that's a signal that all the tests are done, and then we can exit. Uh, and again, if the abort flag is set, then we also have to do an exit, uh, and exiting cleanly, you know, making sure to wait for the responses from all the runners mm -hmm. so we don't get things uh, out of sync. Uh, and then, of course, sending the, the shutdown over to the, to the runners. <coughs> so the RPC call to run a test uh, returns information from the runner once the test is, is complete. So uh, that includes the test result, pass or fail, includes any uh, log messages that be would normally be written straight to the screen, but instead are um, buffered and then sent back to the controller, and also the timings for the test. So the runner buffers uh, the messages into an array and then just returns that to the controller, and then the controller uh, can write that response to the screen all at once, keeping all the, res the results of a single test together so that the output looks exactly the same as it did before. None of the interleaved lines that, that confuse things. Uh, in the, the dash J0 case, I'm sort of skipping ahead here, this is the existing default behavior where there are no processes, it just runs in a single process. Uh, in that case, uh, I do a shortcut and I don't um, buffer the, the output, I just write it straight to the screen. So the output should be 100% identical to, to the case before. Uh, without that, uh, it's rather than seeing the two lines, one running test 001, uh, and then a short delay, and then the result, um, if it's buffered, you'd see absolutely nothing. Then all of a sudden you see test zero one result, and uh, for long running tests, that's a little bit different because if a test takes ten seconds to run, uh, you see no output at all. Uh, but in the J zero case, unbuffering means that you would actually see the, the lines separately. So uh, again, keeping the developer experience as, as close as possible to what was uh, <coughs> expected and more useful, I think. So reliability of tests. This is is the big bugaboo with, with this. Um, a lot of, um, yeah, so implementing parallel tests changed the, the timing of, of running tests tremendously in some cases. Uh, and that showed some weaknesses in, in the existing test harness, the existing tests, and a, a couple in, in curl itself. Uh, so there's a lot of tests that are quite sensitive to timing. Some of them actually have built in uh, timing, um, uh, like timeouts that uh, have to trigger. Uh, and so those naturally are, are sensitive. But there's others that were a lot more subtly sensitive. And uh, some were, were obvious why that's the case, and others just unclear why, why they're so, so sensitive to timing. Uh, the other problem is, yeah, uh, uh, so there's also some tests that were sensitive to the, the segment sizes that were written. Uh, they expect that if, if, it's, if you're writing one block of data, it's all going to appear at once in, in the, uh, the other side, and that's not always the case. Uh, and that is just uh, due to um, uh, running, uh, no, it was changes due to running in parallel, but also in different operating systems that can that can be different. <coughs> well. 
So um, it's just that uh, changing the time also changed some of these subtle things that um, just cause strange failures all over the place. Uh, there's a, um, a bug that I discovered in, in the log file locking. So there's a number of, of servers that could be running. You could have the uh, STL uh, running as a front end to HTTP, um, for example, and each each server creates uh, <coughs> a lock file in, in the log directory as a signal that the server is not quite done running the test. And only when the test is completely finished will it erase that lock file. And that's a signal to the controller that, OK, the server's done. It's finished writing all the logs. It's, <coughs> it's time to go check those logs to make sure they, they hold what, what you want. But this bug meant that uh, the very first server to finish would erase that lock, which meant that the controller was uh, checking these files before they were finished being written. And that caused test failures. That was definitely confusing. Um, but I managed to, to figure that one out. And again, this is an issue that has nothing to do with running into parallel. It's just that uh, the, the, the timing changed, and there were process uh, switches going on that, that didn't before. And that meant that the controller would run before the server in, in cases and would just trigger the situation a lot more often. Uh, there's also some edge cases. For example, on shutdown, FTP tests would often be missing the, the quit command. And Stefan managed to figure that one out. And I, I think it's basically solved now, isn't it? I think so, yes. Solved. Yeah. But that one, again, it's it's so frustrating. <coughs> Looking through these test fails, trying to figure out, okay, my parallel testing was at fault, and it's another FTP quit problem. And the problem with a lot of these tests is, is that uh, they uh, they only show up in, in CI services uh, a lot of the time. And the most most common reason for that is because these the free tier of these CI services are uh, just so hugely over provisioned. They're just throwing all these free services on. There's probably a hundred um, uh, projects running on, on one server at once, and it just slows everything down. And of course, when you have that many process switches going on, time is going to be really out of whack. And it's all kinds of problems, even to this day. Um, there's also some tests use this uh, slow down feature in the test suite to, to put delays between each character uh, for various reasons. And of course, putting a delay in each character means there's an opportunity for a process uh, switch at that point. The kernel switches something else and then runs 100 processes more before getting back to that one. And that just changes the timing so completely. Um, and the maximum timeouts as well that, that some processes have. Uh, you might have a three second timeout. Uh, because, you know, what could possibly take that long on an unloaded developer system, right? Uh, well, you start running on uh, a loaded CI, and three seconds is not long enough anymore. Um, so, um, yeah, so one, another thing I added was in uh, the lib test, which is sort of a framework for writing custom test code, added improved logging there, because a lot of tests, um, they just never failed before, so uh, there was not a lot of logging when there was an error. So I added extra log in there so that when they fail in CI, then you have at least some idea of what's going on. Um, and one other thing, um, yeah, so <coughs> I, I went through a number of tests that were having problems that I couldn't figure out and added two um, keywords to these tests. One was simply flaky, and one is timing dependent. So if you're running the, the make test-ci target right now, it automatically s skips uh, any test having these two, two keywords uh, because it's just too too likely that they're going to fail and give you spurious um, uh, errors. So the problem with that is that, of course, you're, run, you're not running tests that are there for a reason and that can find regressions. And uh, it, it's not the best scenario, but uh, it's probably better than having spurious failures all the time. As, as Daniel's saying, they're, they're happening way too often now already, and I don't want to make anything worse. So the result of all this, here's the output of a, uh, a curl test run that I did on a an IBM Power 10 machine with uh, 192 threads. And uh, yeah, nine seconds to run 1,423 <laughs> tests. So this this is uh, yeah, this is what I was dreaming about for, for a long time here. So I'm glad to finally came to fruition. Uh, I have to, to give a little caveat here. Uh, I did skip the slowest 14 tests over here. So it's still 1,400 tests. It's just that there's a few of these just not running. <laughs> um, the, the problem there. Cheater. Get, yeah, I, I know, I know, I know. I'm guilty of charge. The going lie. The problem is that some of these tests actually take longer than nine seconds to run uh, themselves. So I, I didn't want them to, to skew the results here. 
Um, so you really wanted those nine seconds. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. In exactly. statistics, we call them outliers. It's fine. Yeah. <laughs> outliers, that's right. That's right. Yeah. This is established scientific precedent. You're either doing anything wrong. Um, so there are a few things left to do, and uh, that last one is is one of them. Um, uh, what, what's happening over in some cases is that you, you're running, you know, 1,400 tests, and you're all done those, and then it's it's it starts, you know, one of the last tests left to go, you know, test number 1392, whatever, and that happens to be one of these tests that takes nine seconds to run. So you've just spent nine seconds running 1,400 tests, and then you start the slow one, you spend another nine seconds waiting for this one test to, to run at the end, so you got 18 seconds, doubling your test time. So by moving the slow test uh, to the beginning, that should reduce that problem uh, and should uh, eliminate the domination of, of people slow get tests. happier at the end. Oh, it's not really moving. Well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> it starts out slow and then yeah. accelerates. Yeah, yeah, put it in the turbo. <laughs> That's yeah. what it looked like. But uh, I think that would probably make a difference for that. And again, that can probably be done just by adding um, another keyword, say slow test or something, and then just uh, those get put close to the beginning and run first. So it should be pretty straightforward. Are they, are they valid tests? I mean, why are they so slow? Well, some of them are, are testing timeout scenarios. Right. So, um, and there are a, a couple of tests that are deliberately doing uh, really slow transfers mm -hmm. to um, to try to get uh, like a, uh, one character at a time right, right, um, right. And, and things like that. So there, there are a couple of reasons for, for them. I, I testing 100 continue, like just trying to, uh, do we have our servers, our test servers test at that level? The, yes, there, I think, yeah, 100 continue is one of the special cases of the test mm -hmm. servers. The test servers, uh, they're not forward to the server, they're just doing what you want, and it's pretty dumb in some cases, but, uh, but 100 continue is definitely one of them that, that's supported. Um, so improving the reliability, especially on the Windows CI 400, this, this is the big one for me. Um, because, firstly, I'm not a Windows guy, I don't have a Windows machine to test these things on, uh, and secondly, it's just, uh, how, do you, how do you start debugging this you know, on the CI itself? For some test failures, I added some uh, extra logging, uh, extra things in the test suite to try to figure them out. But uh, it's just uh, Windows. I, I'm sorry if you're a Windows guy, but... Windows is Linux now, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> sure. Ooh, well, well, even Microsoft has seen the light, yeah. Well, Windows NT was Linux, so yeah. Well, I thought VMS. Yeah. <laughs> so if, if there are any Windows developers in the room or any Windows developers listening, there's opportunities to, to serve the community here. Um, so there's another bug that I've, I've seen in a number of tests where uh, the verification of the service, you st the runner starts the server and does a, a quick curl um, query to the server just to make sure it's alive and, and running and ready to go. Uh, that passes, and then it runs the real curl test, and at that point, the, the server just is not li listening anymore. It just stopped. Um, and it's just it's aggravating because I haven't figured out what's going on. But that, that needs to be solved. That's one of the more common failures that I'm seeing these days. Um, any, any type of server or just server? Um, I, I don't remember now if it's a specific type of server or not. Yeah, I've got some notes at home on that. I'll have to check that. Um, I, I haven't uh, looked into to some of these in, in a few months now. Um, but yeah, that's that. Uh, it's it's giving me nightmares, this one. Um, so there's another optimization that could happen, and that is um, to schedule tests to specific runners in a more optimum way. For example, right now, every runner starts its own copy of the HTTP server running the HTTP test, its own copy of the SMTP server that's running the SMTP test, et cetera, et cetera. So basically, by the end of the test suite, all the runners are running all the servers, essentially. And that isn't necessarily necessary. There's only a few SFTP tests. You want to just throw them all in one runner. You can probably get them all in one runner. Save all that startup time and just do it that way. So that would, that would make a little bit of difference. Um, let's see. Yeah, so the, the uh, I didn't write it down here, but the last thing to do would be to enable this on, on CI and, and a regular make test by default. Uh, I, uh, my goal is to make developers' lives better by making the test faster. Uh, that part is, is being accomplished. The problem is, if the tests are failing sporadically, developers' lives aren't better. And as long as enabling parallel tests gives you more false positives, I, uh, I don't really want to do that. Um, uh, 
what I, I should probably be doing is um, enable them on some of the CI services where they are reliable. Some are, are better than others. Uh, some really overload the, the servers, and others don't. They seem to give you a server two cores. You can do whatever you want with. Uh, so that's probably the next step is to, is to do that, uh, and then just digging in, trying to figure out some of these these last <coughs> causes for failures as much as I can. Any questions? Well, I have one question. Okay. If uh, I think I saw your your I don't know if it was a state diagram uh, where a dead runner when you were emitting things. Right. A few, a few back slides there. back. So init it. Oh, wrong, wrong process. Old guy. Okay. Oops. Sorry. So st init it. Dead runner happens. What, um, what's the what? Uh, it died after it clear locks. Yeah. So there's all kinds of, of checks that going on here. So, um, oh, uh, this particular one. Oh, a dead runner. Okay. So <coughs> this is if there, something happens to the runner. So um, whatever, Perl buffer overflow or uh, out of memory and the kernel kills that particular right, uh, right. Perl process. Then the, the pipe goes dead and it returns an, uh, an error on the pipe and then it just says, okay, there's no more runner. Okay. I misread it. I, I see you're starting it up and, and, and the helpfully called the ST in it. Uh, the runner's mm -hmm. already running you, uh, before you're doing clear locks and then yeah, it's you're executing. So yeah. Only if, if it's gone through to the complete uh, end and, the, and run something, started the, the servers and run something, then it goes back to init. It. Only in that case would it actually go into this um, this first the clear locks stage, um, because otherwise there's no server that needs locks cleared. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you.